This is Rachel, and today in our supervision curriculum, we're covering topic 10, prompts and prompt fading. So when we start talking about prompts and prompt fading, we first need to cover a few definitions. The first of which is discriminative stimulus or SD. It's S uh, for stimulus and then D uh, is a superscript for discriminative, um, meaning that it is the instruction or nonverbal cue that evokes a particular behavior or response. This is also the antecedent or what's controlling the behavior or the response. When we start teaching new skills, we are trying to establish a new instruction or cue to signal a behavior at a certain time. In general, when we're teaching new skills, we want our SDs or our discriminative stimulus to be short so that it's quick and to the point and very clear. So for example, let's work instead of, okay, Jimmy, it's time to come over to the table so that we can get some work done. That's a lot of language that our learner then has to process. So keeping things short, we want to be consistent and use the same uh, instruction or cue initially when teaching. And then we can generalize to include other variations of that cue. But if we start with one and are consistent with one, it's going to make uh, learning more efficient uh, for that learner. And then we can add in the variations in generalization. Speaking of generalization, we want to consider what is going to generalize in the natural environment and teach the language that is going to be used. Um, should we teach tissues or Kleenex? Should we teach uh, bathroom or restroom? Look at the natural environment, the home, um, the community where this individual will need to uh, use and respond to those cues and uh, choose what's going to fit best. And then you can additionally generalize to other cues, but you wanna start by teaching the ones that are going to be most impactful. You also don't want to sit there and repeat the same SD over and over again without there being um, a behavior to occur. So instead of saying, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, and the learner is not responding, you want to uh, provide a prompt, which we will get to, in order for the learner to learn what it is that you want them to do when you give that SD. You don't want to just have an SD go and go and go without well, it won't be an SD, first of all. It's not an SD unless it controls the behavior. Therefore, you don't want this cue to go without practicing the behavior, or it will take it even longer to then become an SD. We also need to talk about stimulus control. So when an instruction or an environmental event or cue is reliably followed by a specific response or behavior, then that behavior is said to be under the stimulus control of the discriminative stimulus. So an SD is not an SD until the response has come under its stimulus control. Much like a reinforcer is not a reinforcer unless it increases or maintains behavior, an SD, uh, the instruction or the cue, the stimuli, is not a SD, a discriminative stimulus, until it reliably controls that behavior. So you have to be aware of what SDs are actually evoking behavior and occasioning those responses. If I always tap the chair when I say come sit, then my learner might be responding to the tapping of the chair or the words come sit. But if I'm always doing them together, I don't know. They could be only responding to the combination also. So we need to be really clear what we are doing and what other things might be affecting or evoking uh, the occurrence of that behavior. Often, stimulus control is established by pairing 
what we want to be the SD uh, with an event that already leads to the response. This is what prompting is. Prompting is pairing a new cue with an antecedent, a cue, an SD that already evokes the response. So prompting is using something that already controls the behavior and pairing it with what we want to evoke the behavior in the future, what we want to become the SD. So prompting is a type of antecedent stimulus or event that currently controls a response. For example, if I wanted to teach somebody how to imitate the action, I might say, do this and tap my head. If they already understand the language, do this or copy me or you do it, then that may control their behavior because they understand the language. The language would be the prompt. However, if they don't already know that, then me saying do this and modeling it is probably not likely to be effective in evoking them also tapping their heads. I might need to use some physical guidance um, to show them what I want them to do. Or I might need to use another cue that works for that individual that would control them reaching to their head and copying that. There are different types of prompts. There are response prompts, which are uh, stimuli that control the actual behavior of the learner. And there are stimulus prompts that affect the presentation of the stimuli. Um, some of the different types of response prompts are verbal or spoken prompts, gestural prompts, modeling prompts, physical prompting. Um, it's important, and we're going to talk about fading in a little bit, to fade the prompts as soon as possible so that the behavior is reliably occurring to the SD that you want and not to the old prompt. Um, and we're going to talk about what those fading strategies will be in a minute. So prompting is a way to establish or create that stimulus control. When you prompt, you're pairing what you want to become the SD with something that already is an SD for that behavior. Once the new behavior is uh, evoking, sorry, once the new cue is evoking the behavior with the prompts, then we want to fade out those prompts and just have that new cue serve as the SD for the behavior. Teaching a specific skill usually requires a specific type of prompt. This is going to be based on the skill being taught as well as the learner. It's essential that the prompt that you are using already reliably produces the behavior. So if you are selecting prompts that don't work, they're technically not prompts because they don't already control the behavior. Um, we have to choose what already evokes the behavior for that learner and then pair that with what we want to evoke that behavior for the learner. If the behavior isn't in the learner's repertoire, at all, nothing evokes that behavior, that's where we're probably going to need to use some shaping strategies to get the behavior to occur in the first place. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we talk through some of these examples. So what things are considered prompts? There are different types of response prompts, like I said. One is a spoken prompt. So this is the person hears the prompt. So prerequisites, they have to be able to hear and they have to be able to understand that cue. Um, if it's language, they have to understand that spoken language and specifically the words that you are saying. So um, an example might be my, my desired SD is what is your name? My prompt might be say Toby. And then my learner says Toby because they understand that cue 
that prompt say Toby means I repeat what you said, Toby. Um, I, I hold up a shoe and then I prompt say shoe and then they echo and they say shoe or I hold it up and I say shoe and then they just say the word shoe, right? So we have to be aware of what they're echoing too if that is a, a prompt that we are using. Visual means that the person sees the prompt. So the prerequisites uh, need to be that they visually see and attend to the prompt that you are giving um, and that they understand what that cue is, if it's a gesture prompt, or that they can already imitate if it's a model prompt. So gesture prompts might be something like, come sit or come here or be quiet, right? We might use some of those hand gestures as prompts. We might be tapping the chair where we want them to be. We might be using things to, to get them to attend to a certain direction. Um, modeling would be that we are demonstrating the action. So we are showing exactly what to do, touching your head, brushing your teeth. Um, the Again, the prerequisites are going to vary depending upon specifically what the skill is, but they need to understand that cue or they need to be able to imitate. Otherwise, it's not the right prompt for this skill for this learner. Physical prompting is the individual physically being guided to perform the behavior. Now, physical prompting um, has very few prerequisites, but they have to tolerate the physical touch. So if you are trying to physically prompt a learner who is resisting, who is clenching up and is not letting you guide them, then you can't use it. That's not a physical prompt. It doesn't already evoke the behavior. Sometimes our learners will let us show them or help them. Um, things like when you're teaching how to hold a pencil, they might help, they might let you put their fingers in the right spot or guiding the marks on the paper, um, tying shoes, some of those fine motor skills. Um, with small children, it might be things like dressing. So some of these um, self-help skills, we might use physical prompting to show them how to do it. Um, by physically moving them through the motions. However, your learner has to allow that to happen. If your learner is resistant to being physically touched or physically manipulated, then you can't use physical prompting because if your learner's resistant, that's not a prompt anymore. That is, that is a physical manipulation that is uh, not prompting. Okay. So you can't use a physical prompt on somebody that doesn't want you to use it just like any of these others, right? If it doesn't already control the behavior, um, then it's not a prompt. So if guiding somebody's hand does not evoke them following where you're trying to guide their hand, but instead evokes them clenching up or pulling away, then it doesn't work. This is not the right prompt for this skill for this learner. Um, there are variations sort of to uh, what we might call physical prompting, and we'll talk about that a little bit with the um, uh, fading techniques, but basically it's some sort of guidance, um, some sort of physical contact to help the individual um, perform the skill. Um, Another one that we look at uh, as, a, as a common prompt that you might see is environmental arrangement. So this is where you are staging the environment to produce the correct response. Um, oftentimes, this is uh, more of a stimulus prompt, but it can be a little bit of a response prompt, and I'll, I'll kind of talk about those. So a stimulus prompt, you might set it up like coloring in the lines or which one is, sorry, coloring in the lines, maybe the line itself is traced with glue and dried glue so that the learner feels that line instead of just visually see it. Um, they feel it there when their crayon hits it, right? So maybe that is um, an example of environmental arrangement. 
It might also be things like adaptive equipment that allow an individual to grasp something um, at a uh, from an angle that is easier for them to physically perform. Um, so maybe it's sticking up and when it's sticking up, the pencil is sticking up, then it's easier for me to use the correct grasp than when it's down on the table and I have to pick it up and then twirl it around in my finger to get to the right spot. Um, so one thing about environmental arrangements is that um, they might be used uh, and faded out eventually, but some like adaptive equipment don't need to be faded out. Um, if the learner still needs that support, then that's fine. So how do we effectively use prompts? Um, with the exception of time delay, which is a fading strategy, which we will talk about in a minute, um, a prompt should occur at the same time or as close as possible to what we want to become the SD. This pairing is going to help uh, transfer that uh, instructional control over. We also only want to prompt as much as necessary. This is sometimes a judgment call, but the goal is only to provide the bare minimum level of prompt or support necessary to perform the skill that we are trying to teach. Um, we don't need to give more than that. We need to go with the least amount of support that still helps the individual perform the skill. Um, if you start to fade out or back out your support and the response or the behavior, the skill that you're teaching starts to occur less frequently or doesn't occur always under the right conditions, then you may need to go back and prompt again. And you may need to come up with a different plan for how to fade out that prompt so that the learner is still successful with that skill. You also have to be aware of how to fade the prompts for each individual. Some individuals learn best with certain types of prompt or fed, fading strategies and do not learn well at all with other types of prompts or fading strategies. So the prompt and the fading strategy that you use have to be individualized to that learner. And the prompt has to be something that already evokes the behavior for that learner. Again, you can't teach, um, you can't prompt something that isn't in their repertoire. You would need to use shaping to develop that skill. Um, but if the skill can occur with prompts and prompts that the learner is fine with, right? You're not physically manhandling somebody to make them do something, you are guiding them and they are accepting that um, guidance, then, uh, then you can uh, begin to fade out those strategies afterwards. Um, but you need to pick what's going to work for that learner. Um, and it has to be individualized. I think that's where I was headed. <laughs> All right. You also have to make sure that your uh, individual has the prerequisites necessary to respond correctly to what you want to become the SD. Um, they may not be able to perform the skill with that SD yet. Or in the case of things that might be, um, we talked about like environmental adaptive equipment type options, maybe that's not something that we're even focusing on right now. Or maybe that's not something that uh, is, a, uh, is a necessity or is a goal or, or is a possibility for that learner at this point in time. Um, so you have to choose and make sure that, that you've identified a prompt that already controls the behavior and that you are identifying a cue that is going to make sense for that learner that you could fade out that extra support before you uh, start teaching it. You want to use 
prompts and prompt fading consistently so that all members of the learner's team, professionals, parents, caregivers, et cetera, are consistent with the way they are supporting the individual to learn the new skill and also the way that they are fading themselves out so that the learner can be independent with that skill. Um, and we also talked about unintentional prompts or extra cues that we might be using um, that the learner might be responding to that are not actually the cues that we are trying to get the learner to respond to. Um, so being aware of what it is you are doing with your body, with your eye movements, um, with the materials that you are using can be very helpful um, so that you can identify what needs to be faded out. All right, so let's talk about fading or removing those prompts. So why, why, what would, what is fading and why do we need to use it? So fading involves the gradual removal of a prompt while the response or behavior or skill still occurs in the presence of what we wanted to become the SD. So our learner has now learned that instead of only responding with the prompt, they are now responding with what we wanted to become the SD. And now we're going to remove that prompt so that now the SD controls the behavior. In most cases, the skills that we are identifying to teach um, under new SDs are things that are going to lead to more independence for that learner. So we are fading out support so that the learner can be more independent in their life, in their everyday routines, in their communities. All right, there are uh, three different ways uh, to fade prompts. Um, it's important to fade the prompts as soon as you can without losing that skill that you're teaching so that the learner is uh, performing that skill with the new SD as opposed to waiting on the prompt. And we don't want to over prompt because we don't want to teach our learners to, we don't want to accidentally teach our learners to wait around for someone to help you. We want to encourage independence where our learners can be successful with those skills. So three main ways to fade prompts. The first is fading gradually. So this is probably what most people think of when they think of fading. And fading gradually, you're basically starting with an, a more intense or intensive level of the prompt, and you're going to gradually use less and less intense of a prompt. When you're fading gradually, you need to be very aware of how much prompting the individual is requiring to display the response. And you might have to go a little bit more intense, a little bit less intense, back and forth a little bit to get the consistency and help that learner to be able to then perform the skill independently. Now, one thing with fading gradually is that it's going to look different depending upon the type of prompt that you use. Sometimes um, we get the impression that we should be jumping to different types of prompts. So maybe as an example, somebody might think that they should use a physical prompt and then go to a model prompt and then a spoken prompt and then independent. But physical model and spoken prompts are different types of prompts and may or may not all control that behavior. We need to, when we're selecting our prompt initially, choose the least intrusive best prompt that already evokes that behavior. So if my learner responds to physical prompting, model prompting, and spoken prompting, to do a skill, 
I should just pick one and I should pick probably the one that's going to be easiest to fade out or most natural for the environment, um, which might be spoken or modeling prompting, but almost guaranteed is not physical prompting. So I don't need to start with a more intensive prompt if my learner can perform the skill with a less intensive prompt to begin with. Then when I select the type of prompt, actually it's not even selecting because it's not up to us, it's the learner. When I identify what prompting method works for this learner, then if I want to fade gradually, I'm just going to stick with that type of prompt and do less of it. I'm not going to jump to other types of prompts because my learner may not respond to those prompts in the same way they respond to a certain type of prompt. So I am just going to use less and less intensive of that type of prompt in order to get independence. So for example, a spoken prompt, I might start with say cookie. And then as I fade it, I could go a couple of ways. I could either make my vocal quieter and quieter and quieter, and quieter until there's no sound and then my learner is responding without the spoken prompt, or I might only provide a portion of that spoken prompt. So instead of saying cookie, cookie, I might say cook, 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 and then I fade it out that way. This is something I did with my own child. May I please have blah, 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 and we're working on prompts. And then I'm like, may I? And the learner would say, may I, blah, blah, blah. And then um, they might say, give me juice. And I'd be like, may. And then they'd say, may I please, da, da, da. And then they come up and maybe they forget to say may. And I might just go, mm. And they're like, may I, blah, blah, blah. And then eventually I don't give any prompt anymore. And I just look at them and then they say, may I have blah, 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 right? So that would be an example of just providing less of the spoken prompt. Those are examples of fading gradually of spoken prompts. I'm not jumping around to other types. I'm just doing less of that particular prompt. For a visual prompt, if you're gesturing towards it, um, you would do less and less of that gesture. If you are modeling, you would do less and less of the for the full model, right? So you might be, it might sort of turn into a gesture at that point, but it becomes less and less notable, noticeable. You're not changing to a different type. You're just doing less of the prompt that already worked. For physical prompting, um, this is where you sort of get some of these different labels for physical prompting. So like a full physical might mean that I am um, supporting their weight. I am moving all of their muscles, gross motor movement to perform the action. They're still allowing me, right? If they're fighting me, it's not a physical prompt. It's manhandling and we don't do that. But if they're letting me guide them to show them, but I'm doing pretty much all of the action, then that might be a full physical. A partial physical might be defined as less than that, um, more than two seconds of contact, but not having to support the full weight, something along those lines. Then you might have things where you might say like a touch prompt. So you're only making contact for like a second or two. Um, and then we have sort of this like shadow prompt thing where like we're, we're hovering near the person to help them in case, but we don't actually contact them, but still our presence being that close and being their shadow is, um, is still a level of prompt. And then we need to like back off to, we're standing by the side and they can do it all by themselves. But in all those cases, I'm just doing less of the physical prompt. I'm not changing to anything else. I'm just doing less of the physical prompt. Environmental prompting fading gradually is going to depend upon what kind of prompt you used, right? What the arrangement was. But for example, when I was in college, I set my alarm clock across the room so that when it went off, I had to physically get out of bed, walk across the room to shut it off. That was an environmental prompt to make sure I got out of bed when my alarm went off. 
over time, I was able to bring my alarm closer and closer so that now I can have my alarm next to my bed. I can reach it while still laying in bed and I can still get up when my alarm goes off. I don't hit the snooze over and over again. Okay, so that would be an example of how you might fade gradually a specific environmental prompt. Another fading strategy is many prompts followed by no prompt. So in this case, we are capitalizing on behavioral momentum, performing the same skill over and over and over again, so that it's really likely that they're going to do that same skill again. And we might do prompt, 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 and they've been successful each time. And then we present the SD, but we just don't do the prompt. But because they've done it so many times in a row, they're likely to do it again. And then you have an independent trial. So many prompts, followed by no prompt. Um, generally, uh, if this is a strategy that you are using with the learner, you might go back and forth. So it might be five prompts, one independent, then four prompts, one independent, two prompts, one independent, um, or uh, and then one prompt, one independent, one prompt, one independent, and then get a couple of independents in a row, right? So that might be how it plays out. It's not that you do five prompts and then they're independent and you never have to prompt again. Um, for some learners, it could be, but also it, it might not be. You might go back and forth a few times, but you would shorten sort of how many prompts you provide before you drop that prompt. And these are going to look similar across um, the different types of prompts, but you're going to present the prompt several times in a row, the learners following the prompt, and then you or so you're presenting the SD with the prompt, they follow it, SD prompt, follow it, SD prompt, follow it, SD, no prompt. And hey, they do it because we've just done it three or four times in a row. Um, so that would be for verbal, uh, for visual, same thing for physical or environmental. You're not, in these cases, many prompts followed by no prompt. You never change the prompt you do. You either prompt or you don't prompt. And you're going to prompt, 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 and then don't and see if they can be independent, right? That is a fading strategy. The third is time delay or sometimes called prompt delay. And this is where we systematically delay when we give the prompt in order to basically create this motivating operation of wanting to hurry up and get to the reinforcer. So the learner jumps in and beats the prompt, does it faster than we prompt in order to be independent and get access to that reinforcer. Um, so in this case, you are again, not changing what prompt you use, you are just changing the timing of when you deliver the prompt. So for example, I might um, say, clap your hands and clap my hands at the same time. The me modeling is the prompt. You can imitate my um, clapping of the hands. I say the word, I show you, you copy me. Great. Um, now I want to fade out me modeling it. I want to just say clap your hands and the learner to clap their hands. So I start with a zero second time delay, which is how everything starts. We are pairing our prompt and our future SD as close in time as possible. So clap your hands. Great. Clap your hands. Wonderful. Clap your hands. Good job. So we've done like three in a row there that are zero second time delay. Now, if I want to use time delay fading, I am going to gradually increase the latency between my future SD that I want to control the behavior and my prompt that I know that controls the behavior. Now, the learner will still get the reinforcer if they follow the prompt, but they get it faster if they beat the prompt, if they jump in ahead of time. So clap your hands, clap your hands. Great job, clap your hands. Awesome, clap your hands. There you go, 
Clap your hands. Way to go. Clap your hands. And I'm gradually lengthening that amount of time. And eventually, if time delay fading strategy works well for this learner, then the learner is going to jump in between when I say, clap your hands. And then I sit there and I stare at them awkwardly for 15, 20 seconds, whatever. And they're going to jump in and clap their hands because they know what we're doing and they want to get to the reinforcer faster. So they perform it because we've taught this response and now they're independent and now they get maybe even more or bigger or more intense reinforcer for the independent trial. Um, time delay is a little tricky to get consistent across team members um, but it's not impossible. It just requires a little bit more oversight or a little bit more training and practice to make sure that people are fading at the same pace um, and, and that we're all using the same type of time delay. Now, time delay is not, I'm going to give the SD, I'm going to wait to see if the learner does it, and then I'm going to prompt because that is not an antecedent strategy. If we deliver the SD, we should, when we deliver an SD, we should have a plan. Is this an independent trial or is this a prompted trial? Um, and you should know that when you give your SD, am I going to be helping them or am I going to see what they can do on their own? If I want to see what they can do on their own, and they don't perform the skill, going back to our operational definition, within that time frame, like within five seconds of the instruction or whatever, then it's an error. They didn't do it, and that's okay. Then I want to reset, and I want to provide the level of prompt that's going to be successful for them. Um, if I am using a time delay prompt, then I know and I'm counting in my head how many seconds until I deliver the prompt. So I, um, I'm counting down until I deliver the prompt. And if they jump in ahead of time, fantastic. That means this fading strategy is working. If not, then I'm going to prompt when I planned to anyway. And we are going to reinforce because we are continuing to build that um, pairing of the SD and the prompt. Um, but I'm systematically changing how long I wait each time according to how my learner is performing, according to my fading strategy, not just a wait and see. And then if they didn't, then I'm going to jump in. That's not systematic application. So that is not time delay prompt fading, okay? So I gave an example of what it would look like with like the visual and the model. Same thing with the verbal, you're gonna gradually increase the time between delivering the prompt after you've given the cue. Same thing with physical, same thing with an environmental prompt. Um, what you want to make sure that you are uh, aware of with time delay is that this is planful, this is systematic, and that you are doing um, it consistently. I have found that time delay works really, really well for um, evoking spontaneous vocal behavior um, or uh, verbal behavior, use of, of other devices, AACs and PECs and things like that. Um, but spontaneous uh, vocalizations, especially, I found really helpful um, for getting that learner because you create the motivation for them to jump in and go faster than you. And that's the idea is that you want them to want the reinforcer enough to jump in and not wait for you. They can do it on their own. All right, so what does prompting and fading look like? General strategy, you want to make sure that you have identified the most appropriate pr 
prompt strategy for this learner. What already controls the behavior for them? What is least intrusive? What makes the most sense in that environment? Make sure you have the learner's attention, present the SD, present the prompt that already controls the behavior, reinforce that behavior because they've done it, right? They're going to do it because you prompted them and your prompt already controls the behavior. So go ahead, reinforce that. Over time, you want to fade those prompts out. So you need to identify what fading strategy is going to work best for this learner and for this skill. And you wanna make sure that it's applied consistently. Um, are we fading gradually? Then what do our gradual steps look like? Are we doing many prompts followed by no prompt? Then how many prompts followed by that independent trial? How many prompts followed by an independent trial? Are we doing time delay? So how many seconds are we waiting between the cue, the future SD, and the prompt? Continue to reinforce the unprompted responses. Anytime you get an independent, make a big deal out of it. That's what we're looking for. Um, and intermittently reinforce uh, mastered skills, maintenance skills, or following the prompt intermittently um, for some uh, may be uh, useful, especially for learners that take a longer time to fade out certain prompts. So if prompts are working, why should we fade them out? We touched upon this a little bit. It's important for the learner to respond to those cues in their environment as independently as possible. So by fading out our prompts, we are helping the learner to be more independent in their environment and rely less upon supports or other people. Independence is the biggest reason for fading out our prompts. So for the assignment, define prompt, identify four different types of prompts and what prerequisites uh, are necessary for each type, explain why it's important to fade out those prompts, identify and define the three prompt fading techniques that we discussed, and then there are three um, practice opportunities right here, um, where you're going to outline the prompt and the prompt fading plan for teaching three different skills. So the first one is teaching the imitation of clapping hands. So I want someone to copy me when I clap my hands. So this would be my SD, is me modeling clapping what would be a prompt? And then how would you fade that prompt out? So you're going to select a prompt and you're going to select a prompt fading strategy. And you're basically going to write it out like bullet points um, of what that would look like. First, I would do this, then I would do this, then this, then this, then this. The second um, behavior or skill is going to be following the instruction, clap hands. So my SD is clap hands. You select what prompt you would use. You select what prompt fading strategy you would use. Now, in these cases, it might be best to think about a learner that you have or that you've worked with um, or uh, an individual that you know that doesn't display some of these skills or is currently learning these skills and what might work best for that learner. It's a little bit helpful to have someone sort of specific in mind, um, but it's not required. This isn't something you'll be like teaching. This is just um, a plan. How would you identify and plan these out? And the third one, number seven here, outline a prompting and prompt fading plan for teaching reading the word clap. So our SD is going to be the written word clap. And so what would be the prompt? What would be the prompt fading strategy? As always, if you'd like feedback, you can post your answers to these assignments in the comments and I'm happy to give feedback. Um, subscribe if you would like to get, uh, see all of these uh, curriculum, supervision curriculum series um, and, Hopefully we'll see you for the next one. Thank you so much.